I'm the, the member of the church, the New, New World Church, and uh, the elder in duty is my minister today. Uh, I know because my daughter is involved that they have, they have been working very hard in the last week to
We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please continue to stand. The next song is a, is a really favorite of mine. Uh, Thank you. 
God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of all grace. It's so awesome to come together on this beautiful morning and be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains us, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, for the love of family and friends without which there would be no life. We thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, for the joy that the ear may hear, for the unknown that we cannot behold, filling the universe with wonder, for the expanse of space that draws us beyond the definition of ourselves. We thank you for families who nurture our becoming, for your grace and one more experience of your presence. Lord, our minds cannot fathom the depth of your infinite love for us. We cannot understand why your only son was sacrificed for sinful people like us, like me. Jesus, you had to endure so much on earth, and for this we are eternally grateful. And we shall praise you with all our hearts for all eternity. Father, you know the depths of our innermost selves. And you understand us, that all of us face in our lives. And throughout these difficult times, may we truly trust in you, Lord, denying self and placing all in your hands. May we grow in faith that whatever our circumstances, we need have no regrets, but may entrust our past to your mercy, our present to your love, and our future to your providence. We pray this in your loving name. Amen. Good morning everyone. How are you today? Sleeping? Yeah? So, today I will tell you not just one story, I will tell you two stories. So, First one goes like this. Sally was in the shop with her mother and they bought lots of food. Her mother went to the living room and she was sitting in the kitchen looking on one specific box. That was a candy box full of good candies. And she heard a voice from another room and it sounded like this. Sally, don't forget your dead candies, because first you need to have a proper lunch, and then later on you will have a candy. What a temptation, isn't it? Maybe for some of us, the second story is much more familiar. It goes like this. Move your books on the side, take your pencils and piece of paper. Today we are having a test. Okay. Johnny was sitting next to Nina and he was thinking like this. Hmm, all my days. I didn't learn for this test. What am I going to do? I'm going to get a bad mark. And then what? What will mommy and daddy say? What should I do? Hmm, I know. When Nina starts to look out, I will, hmm, I will think a little bit on her paper and then everything will be sorted out. What do you think? It would be good, dad, what he would do? No. One good example of the Bible is Jesus. When he was 40 days in the desert, he fighted all the temptations what Satan wanted to give him. And did he fall? No? Yes? Of course not. So, I would like to bow our heads and I would say a little prayer to Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for all these kids in church. 
you see that Satan is giving us a lot of temptations and we fight for our life. Please guide us and be our example how we should fight against the temptations. We praise for this, we praise you and pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attending him. I, uh, I want to ask a question. In relationship to Newborn College, our church, sorry, not college, how many people here know what is the meaning of the acronym T-I-M-E-D associated with Newborn Church? T-I-M-E-D. Can you put your hand up if, if you know what I'm talking about? Please put your hand up really high so I can see. I can see one here, two. Wow, we have a lot of visitors at church today. And just a couple of members. It's really wonderful. Um, T-I-M-E-D stand for the core values of New Belt Church. And I'm a little bit devastated that you people don't know your core values. One of my, one of my passions is um, at the, in my ministry is to see if I can get pastors, individuals and churches to understand what their core values are and to embed them into their lives. Listen, our core values are who we are. I'm not a Sabbath keeping tithe paying house reforming Adventist. You can be one of those and crucify the King of Glory. So who am I? And our values define that. And that's why when I, when I learned I was coming here, I decided to check out Newbold's website. And, I, and as soon as I saw the word values, I go, wow, wow. And I click on it, and, and, the, and the five values came up. T-I-N-E-D. Teaching. Involvement. Mercy. Excellence. Diversity. And I love them. All of them are, are, are wonderful values, but I, what I really like, and I don't know, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to the pastor about it. I don't know whether it was planned, but at the core of your set of values is mercy. And I love that. I just, I just love that because I think, I think that's the core value of the Christian life. And I want to be known for mercy. Because that's what I think of Jesus. I don't think of Jesus as a, as a tithe paying, uh, you know, 1844 specials. I, I think of him as this amazing kind person, amazing grace. And I love that about him. That's why in the end I'm an Adventist. In the end, that's, that's the truth that I want to belong to. The scripture reading. Let me, let me talk about why I, I, I chose the scripture reading. It's because of the different stories of the, um, of the temptations of Jesus. Mark has a phrase in there that the others don't. And the little phrase is, he was with the wild animals. Okay? When, I, when, I, when I picked this up as I, was, as I was reading in the Gospel of Mark, I um, asked, why did he include that and the others leave it out? And the commentators give you three reasons. There may be others, but, but they give us three reasons for why Mark put that little phrase in where the wild animal, he was with the wild animals. First one, uh, geography. Where was Jesus tempted? In the wilderness. Yeah, where in the wilderness? Well, out where the wild animals are. Now, Maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense to us to live in a civilized country, civilized countryside. Um, Car and I, my wife, spent the last few years working in Egypt. And, um, you know, you've got the River Nile, the Green River Nile, and then there's, there's green, greenery, everything's plant. They do fantastic vegetables and fruit in Egypt. And then suddenly, where the water stops, it's desert. It's just, it's just as clear as stepping from here to here. You step off the green onto the sand. And then, just beyond that, you go beyond that is where the wild animals are. And so, Mark is just saying geography. That's why, that's why it was there. Other commentators say no. Um, and by the way, you, don't, you can accept all three. The second reason is theological. Jesus was not tempted in the Garden of Eden, where all the animals were nice and, and quiet and calm and responded to him. He was tempted where you are tempted, out in the broken world in which we live, amongst the wild things that are around us and the wild people that we have to do. That's where he was tempted. He understands it when you struggle with temptation, because he was there at the same time. The third reason, and this is the reason I like the best, and um, you can accept all three, you don't have to choose. The third reason is a thematic reason. And this is that, that Mark is signaling up what Jesus' core value is. 
He is in the business of reaching, where, going where wild things are, and bringing them into the fellowship of angels. That's his whole business. And when you start going through the gospel, the gospel of Mark, I think particularly this, I pick this theme up, and as I've been working my way through the gospel, it just jumps out at me like never before. And what I'm going to do this morning is go through a section of Mark, specifically um, chapters two to chapter three, verse six. And there are five or six stories there that I think just this, this theme just jumps out at you in a very powerful way. We could have started earlier, we could have, the, the story before Mark chapter 2 is the story where the, the, um, the leper comes and says, are you willing to heal me? And Jesus is like, am I willing? And he reaches out, and it's a very passionate section. Jesus reaches out with compassion for the man, it's his, it's his passion for this man, and he heals him. But that's the only part of the sermon. Um, the first story in Mark chapter 2 is the story of the man who comes down through the roof. It says, it, it begins by saying that Jesus was in his house. Uh, preaching. In Mark chapter 1, he said, my aim is to preach the good news. So in the house, what would he be preaching? He'd be preaching the good news. So he's there preaching, teaching the good news, when this guy comes through the, comes through the roof of, of, the, of the house. And we usually go to this chapter to discuss Jesus' uh, claims of divinity. But I want you to notice what Jesus does first. He goes up to the guy and says, you're forgiven. That's the first thing he does. It's, it's not like, what's your name? Why are you here? Okay, and, and after a bit of discussion, he can say, well, by the way, God forgives you. No. Jesus' core message is, you are forgiven. Take that in. You are forgiven. That's the first thing he wants to give to this man. Isn't that the first thing we want to give to people? Is it? Think about it. It's a core value. It's Jesus' core value. To give mercy to people. The second story, Jesus is walking beside the seaside, beside the seashore, and there's a man sitting at his booth. He is not standing away from it saying, I really don't want to do this, I would rather be a follower of Jesus. He's sitting at the booth, he's taking in the taxes. This is Matthew Levi, okay? And he's doing his bit. And I, I like to liken tax collectors, they're traitors, um, they're ripping off their own people. I like to equate them as... You know, he's a member of the mafia. And he comes up to you and says, you pay up or your, or your business will burn down. So there's a manipulation. They, they make money out of looking after you. They give you a service, but they're ripping you off. And so there's this guy sitting there, and Jesus going past, looks over at Matthew Levi, and I love the fact that his name is Levi. I'm assuming that he is a PK. This boy grew up in Levi's home, and he's gone wild. And Jesus reaches, looks across to him and says, Matthew, come follow me. Amazing. Now Matthew could have said, nah, you want to do that. But Jesus, Jesus loves people more than anything. And you have him reaching out to Matthew. And Matthew has done nothing to demonstrate that he deserves it. And Jesus invites him. Amazing grace. We, I spent a couple of days this week here with the field, field leaders. We were interviewing prospective ministerial students and um, boy, if one of them had come up and said, what's your present job? Well, presently I'm uh, working for the Mafia. I would like to be in the ministry. We would, we would have said, you got some things, some loops to jump through first and some things to straighten out before we will ever consider you for ministry. Not Jesus. There's this core value, grace and, and, and mercy towards people. And it's there. It's right there in that, in that very first part of the story. Then Jesus goes off to Matthew's house and um, he's sitting there with sinners. Let's call them sinners. And the Pharisees are going, why does he do that? Why does he go and eat with sinners? And I love Jesus' answer. I love Jesus' answer. Jesus effectively says to, you, to them, how many of you pick up your phone and call your doctor when you're really well and feel the top of the world and say, doctor, I'd like a visit? Come on, you don't do that. Nobody does that. He says, I'm a doctor. I am here to reach broken people. I'm here to, to reach lost people. That's why I eat with these people. Would we? You know, he was a friend of prostitutes. Some years ago, I worked in Middlesbrough. And to get to the church where it was then, I had to go and drive past a, a low wall. It was about the height of the seats. And every Wednesday night when I went to prayer meeting, 
um, there were a group of ladies used to sit on, on this, this wall. And I still remember thinking, what would Jesus do? He'd stop in the car and get out and go sit on the wall. I never had the courage to do that in case a church member drove past and asked, Lou, what are you doing with those prostitutes? Um, but for Jesus, his, his core value, he loved people more than anything. He reached out to people like that. And I, I would love to see the day when I come to church and say, excuse me, how many of you are prostitutes? And several hands go up. I was invited by my friends here. Wouldn't that be fantastic? What kind of church is that? There were, were people invite prostitutes and they come to church with us. Amazing church. So Jesus has this passion for people. The next story is um, when the Pharisees... Are, and just think about the value structure here. The Pharisees are going... The Pharisees are fasting. John's disciples are fasting. But your disciples aren't. Now, what are they doing? They're ranking them, see? The real spiritual people fast. The unspiritual people, people don't. So, so Jesus clearly comes in third, as far as their thinking is concerned. And again, I love Jesus' answer. Jesus could so easily have said, uh, come on, what are you talking about? Uh, I might need a theologian here to correct me, but my reading... Well, scripture, I understand that you only are required to fast once a year. Once a year. The Coptic church in Egypt, they fast over 200 times a year. And a lot of Adventist churches I go to, I constantly hear next week is fast week, or next Wednesday is fasting day, or whatever. We, we fast quite a lot in some of our churches. And Jesus says to, to the Pharisees, can we switch that? Instead of measuring people by their fasting, can we measure it by joy? And he said, I'm the bridegroom. That's why they're not fasting. This is, this, this is a religion of joy, not of solemnness. And, and I love that too, about, about Jesus. It's, it's, it's a value that, that, that's different. Again, working in Egypt, um, I attended and, 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 and took a number of wedding services. And a wedding service in Upper Egypt is just crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. Even during the sermon and the ceremony, there are people whistling and hooting and hollering, and, and it's just a, a time of joy. And they can't sort of wait till the, till the wedding thing is over because then they go into dancing and, and eating in the streets, and it goes on till midnight, and, and you're asleep. asleep. Uh, they still want you to, 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 to enjoy. Go online and have a look at, a, at, a, at an Orthodox, even an Orthodox Jewish wedding, and see the joy that's expressed there. And Jesus is saying, Guys, our, our religion is about joy. It's about joy. It's not about fasting. So Jesus values, turns it up and it's, it's a, he values people and wants them to enjoy the walk with Christ. The next story is uh, Jesus walking through the cornfield, uh, the grain field. And the, the disciples are, I, I can see Jesus such a people person, I, I can see him at the end of the service, um, taking so long to come, a bit like my wife, she takes ages to leave church. And he's, um, Late, and they're going somewhere, and the disciples are walking through the, the, the grain field, and they're plucking corn, and you know the story, I don't need to tell it. And the Pharisee, the inevitable Pharisee, steps up and says, you shouldn't be doing this on Sabbath. It's Sabbath. And again, get your values. Work out what the values are. What is the value of that Pharisee? What is his top priority? I'll come more to that in a minute. And again, I love Jesus' answer. Jesus could have said, could have said, listen, scripture only requires it once a year, David Tony. What are you doing? This 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 oh, that was fasting, but you, the scripture doesn't talk about this greenfield thing value. <coughs> Jesus answered to him and says, If your king, your greatest king, David, and go into the, 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 the um, sanctuary and take the showbread, which is unlawful for anyone to eat but the priest. If your king, out of kindness to his men, can go and take the showbread and feed it to his men, which is unlawful to do it. This is amazing. He's breaking scripture. He's saying, we don't have to obey the scripture. And that's something we need sometimes to wrestle with. If your king can do that, can't I, the Lord of the Sabbath, Son of Man, can't I show kindness to my men? 
It's a beautiful answer. Jesus is saying, listen, my top value is mercy, kindness. It's my top value. You Pharisees just got your value order upside down. Jesus illustrates it a number of times in Matthew 23, where he says, you tithe, mint, and anise. That ought you to have done. But don't leave the other undone. Mercy and justice. And that's so often the problem. See, not, Jesus isn't against tithing. He's not against dress standards. He's not against vegetarianism, I'm sure. Um, but he's just saying, our top values aren't those. We have higher values. When we come to the last story, uh, Mark chapter 3, 1 to 6, I, th I think of it this way. Jesus has been... There's a progressive clash with the Pharisees. In the beginning, the first story in chapter 2, verse 1, he's in, quote, his house. So he's on his turf, okay? Pharisees are in conflict with him. And then it moves out of there to Matthew's house. Pharisees have no say there. Then it moves out into the corn, the, the grain field. And the Pharisees are beginning to come and close. So you're at least out of Matthew's turf. But then this last story, verses 1 to 6 in Mark, he's on their turf. He's in the city. And I, I think this is a really significant story. There is a clash of two, two value systems. Huge clash. It is so strong, but, and it's so early in Mark's Gospel. Chapter 3, verse 6, it says they went out to meet with their audience to see how they might kill him. Wow. You know, the clash is so strong, I'm going to kill you. Because you don't agree with my value system. And what happens in that synagogue? You read between the lines and, and, and you figure out that they are setting Jesus up. They've, they've put this guy there with his withered hand. And they're going, let's, let's, let's see. Let's see how, take, how strong he is on his values. And the scripture says that Jesus stood up and looked about them with what? Anger. Sometimes we think that Jesus demonstrates his anger uh, when he cleanses the temple, drives the, the money, the, the sellers out, and the animals out. But I think this passage is really significant. He is looking, he is in his church, looking at his people, and he is full of the wrath of God. Revelation 14 stuff. And that's very scary. Very scary. That he could be looking at you and saying, I am so angry. And again, in, in that passage, there are very emotive words. Huge emotion is happening in Christ. And for me, this is, the, this is the story, or the event, where the church kind of splits. Verse 6, it says the Pharisees went out. Verse 7 says Jesus also went out. Like they're going in a separate ways. And shortly after verse 7, Jesus um, chooses the 12. It's like he's starting a new church. He can't handle the old. I preached on Matthew, uh, Mark uh, 3, 1 to 6 once, and after the service, a lady came up to me and said, Lou, couldn't Jesus have just kept peace? And at the end, said to her, with anybody who wants healing, I'll be here tomorrow morning on Sunday at 9 o'clock and just come on and I'll heal you back. And she said to me, Lou, why didn't Jesus do that? And my, my response was, Jesus is so passionate about caring about people that you cannot stop him. He's actually saying, I, I love mercy more than sacrifice. I actually think people are so valuable, so precious to me, that they're my top priority, my top value. Why would I wait for someone? What are our top values? This morning, I, and I collect stories. Because of my interest in this topic, I collect stories. Uh, I might share a couple with you. I have a friend who's a pastor in America. And he was visiting Scotland. We got talking about these kind of things. And he told me this story. He said, Lou, I have a son. I grew up in my home, of course. I loved him. Came uh, baptized. Grew up. And then, and then went away to university. Drifted in there. No longer comes to church. And at, this, at that time, he was working in the conference, this guy, so he, um, he said, I was going to visit that city where my son lives, and um, I emailed him and said, son, I'm preaching at so-and-so church, please 
I'd love to see you. Could you come to church? So he goes. And during Sabbath school, he says he was sitting in the, in the front and, and he kept looking around to see if the door, every time the door opened, he couldn't see if it was Sunday coming. But he didn't come. And then comes the divine service time and he's, he's now sitting up on the platform and all the preliminaries are going on and he's sitting there and, and he's, there was a car park on the side there where he could see vehicles. And he sees a vehicle pull up and out of it gets his son and, and a young lady. And he says, look, my heart began to beat. My boy was coming to church. Wow, my boy was coming to church. And then he said they walked around and they, then they were obscured and then they, uh, after a little while, he saw them walk back get in the car and drive off. And he thought, oh, what's happened? So he does the service, he preaches a sermon, and then he hurries down to the door, to the door where the, the, the deacon on duty is, and he says to the deacon, did you see, just before the sermon began, did you see a young man and young woman come in? And the deacon says, I saw them. Did you see the length of her skirt? I told her, if you want to worship in our church, you go home and get dressed properly before you come worship. Now, some of you gasp. Um, some of others may have said that's the right thing to do. The question I want you to rest, wrestle with, what are the values of that deacon? What are his top values? There's no mercy. And listen, I'm, I'm not against dress standards. I really am not against dress standards. Dress standards is a big problem. I have another friend who's a pastor who was on holiday in a, in a tip on, a, on an island in the, well, let's call it tropical. And, and they're on holiday, and Friday, they go in search of an Adventist church. They, they go along asking people, nobody seems to know where there's an Adventist church. So they think, oh, well, maybe there isn't one here. So they said, let's, let's uh, tomorrow morning, let's take our Sabbath school lesson, some sandwiches. And they got up and decided to go find a nice, quiet beach where they could just sit and enjoy the Sabbath and do the lesson. So they were just very casual, okay? So off they go. But on the way, they see, they see these people carrying their Bibles, and they and nice dressed like, like I am. And um, they decide they must be Adventists. So they, so they follow them down a couple of streets, and sure enough, there's this Adventist church. And, he and, this, and this guy's a pastor, right? They both go, whoa, we can worship with our people today. So they walk up the steps to the door, and a deacon steps out and says, where, do you, where are you going? And they thought it was rather obvious, but they said, well, come to church. They said, you're not coming to church in our church dressed like you are. And I'm sure they weren't dressed outrageously. But he's a pastor. And he's, he's standing with, uh, his breath is taken, he didn't know what to say to this deacon. When another deacon steps out and says, I know you, you're pastor so and so, I've seen you on, on, the, on the, in the training video. And the pastor goes, yes, that's me, that's me, I'm him. And then the other deacon says, but you're still not coming to our church, just like <laughs> And again, I ask the question, what are the values? What are the values, the, the, the order of values that that one has? And I said, Jesus is saying to us, we can, we can have those values, but when you turn them upside down and make them the top values and allow them to trample on the lower one, on the other ones, We've lost the way. I'm not a huge fan of the, the clear word, but Matthew 5, 20, 20, I think it's 20, where it says, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never make it into the kingdom of heaven. Clear word is the one verse I really like in the clear word. It says, Unless your values exceed the values of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never make it into the kingdom of heaven. No exceptions. Never. And Jesus is saying to us, to us as individuals and as churches, listen, unless our values are higher than the values of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not in the kingdom of heaven. You can all be a bunch of people here who are not in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know where you are, but you're not. You can even be a great evangelist, track across land and sea to make them a convert and make them twice as fit for heaven. So values are really important. And, and, I, and I'd like to challenge each one of you to look at the values of your church again. And the, the next time somebody asks what this T-I-M-E-D stands for, I'd love, I'd love everyone to put their hand up and say they stand for teaching, involvement, mercy, excellence, diversity. 
And again, I love the fact that mercy is the center of those set of values. Love that. Love it. Let me use an illustration. Because I think there are organizations outside of us that have figured this out when we are so often far behind. I'm going to use Sainsbury's or Tesco or Asda. Fred. Fred is walking along the road and he feels, he feels a certain feeling in his stomach. It's called hunger. And he's walking along the road and he says, I need to get something to eat. And he looks around and he sees this Sainsbury's. So he goes up and he walks up to the door and the door opens by itself. I don't know any church that does that. Door opens by, he doesn't even have to hold, push the door open. And he steps inside and the, um, he doesn't know his way around the shop, typical man. He steps inside and he asks, do you, do you do sandwiches? And what does the guy do? Yeah, come, come, come this way. Takes them down several aisles. Down here, sandwiches. He says, do you vegetarian? Absolutely. The green tick, that's, that's vegetarian. And Fred is able to pick it up and read in plain English. That's what I want. And he goes and gets it. Tesco has learned. You do not put anything between Fred and meeting his need. Don't. They've learned that. Now compare this. Mary. Mary has been to a party on a Friday night. She became so drunk that she has no idea on Saturday morning when she wakes up how she got home. She doesn't even know what happened to her. And she's lying there and her first feeling is suicide. She wants to kill herself. But it's a beautiful day like today and she decides, I'm going to go for a walk. So she gets out of bed. Her hair is just raveled. I don't know what's on her dress or what kind of dress she's wearing, but she walks along the road and she happens to stop outside a building that says, Set there at this church. Now this is what could happen to Mary. She goes up and she struggles to open up into church. She says, well, I don't know the way into the church. It's the wrong door and I've got to go around looking for the door. She, she has to struggle with this door. I went to one of our churches not long ago where it was big old door and, and the sign was so bad that I wasn't clear what time the service began. It was so peeling. So I, I opened this door and I step in and there's a second door within and the second door has this big sign on it. Guess what it said? What should it say? Jeff, what should it say? Well, this one said wipe your feet. That was it. Okay, so now I'm eight year old so I've got to wipe my feet. And I, I thought about my feelings about that and I thought, so, I'm an eight-year-old, and I need to be told to wipe my feet before I'm allowed in this place. So I go in. Believe that. Believe that story. Mary then goes in, and the deacon could say to her, you shouldn't be dressed like this, coming to church. Could be said to her, like a couple of stories I gave you. And Mary stumbles, I'm sorry, I was just out for a walk. Sorry. Or she could be said, have you been drinking? Could be. Maybe she gets through that. Maybe it's not too bad. She goes and sits down and somebody could come up to her and say, you, you can't sit here. Um, go and sit over there. Please. This is where we sit. It can happen. It happens. And then she's given a, a, a book, which she's never looked at before. And it's, uh, of course, it has to be the King James Version. It has to be. Otherwise, you know, you really don't understand the truth unless you don't understand what you read. Um, and Mary struggles through it. And there are people like that. I was in a church very recently where a lady sat next to me and the text was given and she opens the Bible and she says, can you help me find this? So I, I found the text for it. And then she says, what are all these little numbers down the side? And the first numbers. And I explained that that helps us to find exactly where we are in the book. She says, what a brilliant idea. Why aren't all books done this way? And I loved it. It occurred to me that this lady didn't know what the Bible was and hadn't had one. But Mary has to read it in the version that's the hard one to read. Why do we do that? What, 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 why does Tesco's worked it out that you put nothing to hinder Fred meeting his need? But we say to Mary, Mary, before you come to this grace, that's the, by the way, it's the only thing that can save her. The only thing that, dress isn't going to save her. Food stands isn't going to save her. 
Stopping smoking isn't going to save her. None of those things are going to save her. Only the grace of God. And it's the only thing that can change her. But we say to Mary, Mary, you got to jump through these loops before we offer you the gospel of grace. <laughs> Something's wrong. Why can't we work that out? Why can't we understand that's not the way Jesus was? Jesus is eager to call Matthew Levi's and to welcome prostitutes and tell them, you're forgiven. You are forgiven. You're forgiven. Because it's his core value. That mercy is his core value. And it has to become ours. I'm, I'm taking a service tomorrow morning. My wife and I are taking a service at a prison. And I'm, I'm thinking of talking about who I am. And I'm not going to tell them that I'm a Sabbath-keeping, tight, paying, advent believing, health reforming person. I'm going to tell them I am amazed by the incredible God that I serve. Incredible. That's what I want to be known for. And that's why, that's why I like the values T-I-M-E-D that are here. Because at the core of it is mercy is its greatest value. And that's not just what the church wants to be. The church wants each one of you to be like that. I'm not sure what I have to do at the time. This morning when I did the early service, I had I kept being told time was up. Um, but I could tell you so many stories. And what makes me very sad is I could tell you stories of secular organizations that are just doing phenomenal service. Just a quick one. Go, go look at Rich Carlton's website. They have a button on there called Memories. Click on the button Memories and read some of the stories of amazing service to people. That, that's kind of what I've modeled this wow button. Click on wow and, and look at some of the amazing things some Adventists do stand for. Ritz Carlton is an amazing organization committed to services their number one value, serving people. And they talk about we are ladies and gentlemen, all their staff, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen however they can. And you can have, there's a, there's a, I read a book on, on Ritz Carlton, it's got a, it had a whole lot of stories of just amazing service to people. I only read three or four and I said, I wish I could afford to go to Ritz Carlton. I'd love to be one of their guests because it's just, and that's what I want, that's what we want. We want people to run into Adventists and say, wow, wow, I want to know that person more. I want to go to their church because that's the kind of people Adventists are. That's where I want to be. I don't care what day of the week they go to church. Let me finish with the story. This is a story that's so old. Um, it shocks me when I tell them in churches nobody knows it. Uh, but I read it in the uh, uh, review, so it has to be true. Um, Bob. Bob is a hell's angel. Okay. Hell's angels, I don't need to explain about them. Um, they ride motorbikes, they uh, wild people, they deal in drugs and prostitution and extortion, all sorts of stuff. Okay. Bob's a hell's angel. One day he tears his, his jacket and he goes into a shop and, uh, to get it repaired. So he goes into this store, and I'm going to pick on you. He goes up to the young lady behind the counter, you don't mind me. And he's stunned by her. He's just this beautiful young lady, and he says, Why, you're gorgeous, so uh, can I go out with you? And she, she repels him, rightly so, yeah. rightly so, repels him and says, Good. And so he backs off, and he's, he tells her why he came, and gives her the leather jacket, and she says, Come back in two days' time, and we'll repair it. But Bob is fit. Bob is falling in love with this girl. And he goes, goes off and, he, and all he can think about is this girl. So the next time when he comes back, a couple of days later, he comes back in and the first thing he says to, you, to her is, I am so sorry for the way I spoke to you. He said, but you are so beautiful. You tell him that. You are so beautiful. He said, I, 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 I'm really sorry. Um, I'd like to apologize. And um, can I take you out for a meal? He says it to him. She... She's not a Christian, and she says, okay. So they go out for lunch, okay? They begin dating. After a while, they're living together. And one Friday night, 
as they're lying there in bed, let's call her Mary. Mary turns to Bob and says, Bob, I'd like to go to church tomorrow. And Bob about leaps out of bed. He jumps, he says, church? Mary, I don't do church. I'm a hell's angel. We don't go to church. I, I have nothing to do with church. Why do you want to go to church? And Mary says, I don't know. Something in me just says, Mary, go to church. And Bob is really upset. He says, Mary, we're not doing church. And Mary says, Bob, I feel so strongly about it that if we don't go to church, maybe we should split. Now that, that's, that grabs Bob's heart. And Bob says, Mary, okay, okay, I'll take you to church. But only once. We'll go to church, but that's it. You understand? Then he says, but Mary, you got it wrong. Well, she says, why? He says, we're not going to church tomorrow. She says, why? Because tomorrow's Saturday. Church is on Sunday. No church on Saturday. She says, there has to be. He says, why? Because she said, when I was a little girl, we had neighbors, and this couple were the nicest people I can ever remember. There's an advert. There's an advert for Adventists. And they went to church on Saturday. I don't know what church, but they went to church on Saturday. So Bob gets the hymn, the hymn book, the phone book, and, and he flips to churches and he starts looking down the list of churches and he goes, Sunday, 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 Mary, there's no churches on Saturday, it's all Sundays, he says, keep going, Sunday, 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 Saturday, whoa, there's a church that goes to church on Saturday, she says, what is it, he says, the Seventh Day Adventist, never heard of it, she says, neither have I, but that's where we're going to church tomorrow, so Sabbath morning at 10 o'clock, they turn up at church, and they go and sit in the front row, because it's always no one sits in the front row. Um, they go and sit in the front row for Sabbath school. They're dressed in their full Hell's Angel gear. Okay, the leather jacket, things on the back, and all that sort of stuff. And Bob is afraid of no one. He goes and sits in the front. Pastor stands up to teach the Sabbath school lesson. He says, our topic today is, and Bob stands up and says, I'm not interested in that topic. He says, I want to know if there's a God, why is there evil? And the pastor says, that in, in when he wrote the article, he said on the Friday night, as he was preparing the lesson or finishing off preparation, he was strongly impressed to prepare to answer the question that he's now being asked. So he says to the church, Church, do you mind if um, we don't do the lesson today, we, we do the man's question? They go, sure. So he does it. At the end of Sabbath school, Bob and Mary stand up and walk out and go home. Next Friday night, they're lying in bed, and Mary says, Bob, I'd like to go to church again tomorrow. Bob says, Mary, no, no. Now, Mary, understand something. I am a, we are hell's angels. We don't do church. And Mary says, this, was there a problem last week? He says, no. She said, Did, didn't you not like the pastor? He goes, okay. Did he answer the question? Yeah, not bad. Not bad at all. Well, why can't we go again? Mary, I don't want to do church. And Mary says, Bob, I really feel so strongly about it. But I'm asking you to come to church. I'll go by myself. Bob says, okay. We'll go to church. They go to church. Sit in the front row again. They do Sabbath school, go home. Next Friday night, same thing again. And she persuades Bob again. If you don't take me to church, Bob, I think we're going to... And Bob can't take that, so he takes me to church again. This time, as they're going out, the deacon at the door says, really nice to have you folks at church today. Uh, at Sabbath school today, but why don't you come to church? And Bob goes, we just did come to church. He said, no you didn't, you came to Sabbath school. Church starts in about 15 minutes time. And Bob goes, these crazy people, but they go home. So on the Friday night now, Mary has a new angle. She says, Bob, why don't we do church today? Ah, oh, says Bob. Mary, please. No, she said, we haven't done church. We've done Sabbath school. We haven't done church. Okay. He says, okay. So they go to church, sit on the front row again, and the preacher, it wasn't the pastor, but the preacher preaches on tithing. That's not a good topic for Bob. He just is climbing up during the whole thing. They go home next Friday night. Mary says, Bob, I'd like to go to Noah's. He says, no, Mary. Didn't you get it last week? That's all they want is your money. That's the only thing they want from us, your money. So we're not doing church, Mary. That's finished, finished. And she says, no, Bob, that's not what the preacher said. What did he say? Well, you talked about this deal with God where you trust him and he blesses you. Now, come on, Bob. 
preacher talked about entering into a contract with God, a contract of trust. And what you do is you give some of your money to God, and God gives you back more than you gave. Isn't that what he said? Bob goes, yeah, something like that. She says, Bob, wouldn't you love God blessing you? Yeah, that'd be cool, he says. That'd be nice. But, um, Bob, let's go to church. So they go to church. They go to church, and, and Bob sits on the front, Bob and Mary sit on the front row again. And when the plate comes around, Bob stands up. And he says, Church, I want you to listen to me. Last week your pastor said, you heard him, that if you give your, gift, your money to God, trust him with that, he will give you back more than you gave. Did you hear him say that? And the church is all going, yeah. He says, okay, I'm putting $15 on the plate today, and if I don't get more back this week, you ain't seen me again. Tucks it in the plate. He goes. Friday night comes. Mary says, Bob, let's go to church again. And, and Bob says, Mary, I wasted $15 last week. I threw it. I didn't get a penny back. Nothing. I tell you, Mary, they just rip you off. And Mary says, Bob, how much did you give? He said, $15. She said, that's not a tenth. He goes, what do you mean? She says, the pastor talked about a tenth. Mary, you're talking about like $35, $40. She says, yeah. He says, Mary, I am not throwing away $35. No, 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 no way, Mary. She says, Bob, listen. He says, listen. He says, Mary, he didn't bless me. She says, Bob, but listen, the pastor talked about a contract. And if you have a contract with someone and you agree, you do that for me and I give this to you. If he doesn't give that to you, do you give him what you have? He says, no, I wouldn't. He's broken the deal. And he says, you didn't keep the deal with God. Bob goes, no, I didn't. Well, okay, Mary. Only once. I'll show you. I'll show you. So they go to church. Sit in the front row. And when the offering plate comes around again, Bob stands up and he turns to the church and says, I'm here this week not because God blessed me. He didn't give me anything. I'm here this week because I'm going to pay a tithe. Okay, this tenth deal. And I'm putting $35 in the plate. If I don't get more back this week, you ain't ever going to see me again. And he throws it in the plate and, and, and goes, goes to his seat. Friday night comes around. Bob says to Mary, Mary, we're going to church tomorrow. This system works. It works. I got back much more than the $35. We are going to church today. So they go to church. They sit on the front row. And this time, wow, they don't need a preacher. Because Bob stands up and the offering comes around and says, How many of you don't pay tithe? <laughs> if you don't pay tithe, you are stupid. Because this works. Last week I put $35 and God just blessed my business so well. He said, I'm putting in $45 today. Wow, I'm, I'm just amazed. Like, so he goes, he goes home. And the next Friday night, he says, Mary, we're going to church again tomorrow. I've got to tell these people. So he goes back and he tells, and, the, and his, his offering goes up to 50, 55, whatever. And uh, it's, it's increasing. And each time he stands up and tells them, you've got to pay time. It's an amazing system. You get back a lot more than you put in. On the third Sabbath, he's back and he stands up and does his spiel when somebody puts their hand up. says, Bob, can I ask a question? And Bob says, yeah, go ahead. They say, what is your business? And Bob says, I sell drugs. <laughs> now the pastor's sitting there and the pastor says Bob could we have a little chat up here? <laughs> and that begins a series of Bible studies and then one Sabbath the pastor stands up and he says church we're going to do church a little different today this is supposed to be Sabbath school we're not doing Sabbath school today we're having our wedding service Bob and Mary are being married today and then after the wedding service we're going to have a baptismal service. Bob and Mary being baptized today. And then there's no, you'll notice there's no offering today. Because we're having a potluck meal. And all of you are invited to stay. And there's going to be a bucket at the potluck meal. And I want you to put in everything you can. Because Bob and Mary have broken all connections of, with the uh, Hells Angels. Um, because of danger to their lives. They're going to actually move, move to live right away. We've agreed with another pastor in the Adventist church. They agreed to move there and to live there and to live new lives of seven day with us. Isn't that a lovely story? But here's the question. Why would God bless the tithe of a drugstore? When I was pastoring in Middlesbrough, kind of opposite the church, was a prophet. 
And one day I was opening up the church when a guy came across and he said, you the pastor here? And I said, yes, I am. And he gave me a 20 pound and he said, I want you to put that in the plate. And I've shared that with, I shared that once with a group of pastors and they said, oh, Lou, you should not have touched that money. You should not have touched it. It's evil. So what's God doing? Accepting the tithe of the drug stand. Isn't he still, still in the business of reaching wild people where they are and bringing them into the presence of the company of angels? Isn't he? That's his top value. It's his top value. What's yours? Would you do that? Would you go anywhere, any length, to meet the wild thing and say, come home. You're welcome. You're forgiven. Come follow Fill your life with joy. Understand that God will break all rooms for you. Because he's prepared to die. He loves you more than anything. More than anything he wants them to know. He'd rather die than let them go. Because God loves people more than anything. My challenge to you is, is to get to look at the values of your church. Please look at them. And then ask yourself, what are your values? What are your top values? And embed, embed the values of Jesus Christ into your life. Become like Him. Look at the kind of person Jesus is. Don't you want to be like Him? He is so beautiful. I love Him. I just love the way He does things. I love the way He relates to people. And I so want to be like Him. I'm, real, I'm, real bad. I'm a real good failure at it. But I love it. And I love the values of your church. And I pray that God will help all of us. To embed those kind of values into our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand. As we sing our closing song.
Father, we're just amazed by your character, who you are. And I'm so grateful for that, that love that reached out even to one such as I, such as the people sitting here. Father, I, I, I know that if our church can be the epitome of your grace, we're going to finish the work and go home. And Father, there are so many people out there that to many Adventists are unlovable. But you would have loved them and extended grace, forgiveness, acceptance and calling to them. Dear Lord, help us to be like that. Thank you for your blessing today. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen.